Welcome to the virtual towers of Binary Arcadia, where the games go on long into the night. Today's episode is going to be a bit of a doom and gloomer in as far as we're talking about our fears for the gaming industry. We've actually already recorded this once, but silly me, I ran out of space on my phone, so I'm having to redo it. At least we, we know the material well, hey Rich? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I did want to head this uh, this video though just by saying I don't want us to come across like we're very ungrateful gamers, you know, who feel hard done by in any way, shape or form because I don't think that represents us at all. We feel privileged, I think, to be where we're at with video games, to have the quality and calibre of games we, we play on. Um, and it, it, of course, that is what inspired this whole channel, Breath of the Wild, and how good a game that was for us. You look how far games have come over you know, the last 20 or so years. It's miraculous. So we're very grateful video gamers. Um, I think I, I speak for both of us on that, Rich. Absolutely, mate. I, th I think in some respects, we're sort of the privileged generation when it comes to gaming, because there's so, so much scope. You could pick a game up that you can play for five minutes, or you can pick a game up that you can play for 100 hours. We're so blessed with this massive, wide, diverse variety of games. It's insane. And they're available on almost every platform. You know, there's more platforms. There's genres mm. for everybody. We're sport rock. Let's not. Let's not. And, and all different ways of getting it. You can download it, buy the games, actual discs. Yeah, there's. Yeah, we're absolutely spoiled. So we don't want to come across like we're not grateful for what we've got. But that being said, you know, there are some some waves within the industry that you know I think a lot of kind of hardcore or even traditional gamers are not happy about. We're, we're perhaps departing from some of the, you know, the ethics um, uh, of gaming that, you know, we appreciated in the past and, and especially that have been, you know, developed by companies like Nintendo who have such a great reputation for, you know, just, just treating gamers with respect, um, delivering quality content, just leading the way as, you know, exemplars of, a company that really they have a great image and and you know you can have a lot of respect for so anyway we've um we split a few different categories here that rich and i are both can introduce uh, alternatively and just kind of flesh out a bit and embellish on i'm sure there's plenty more besides what we're going to say so if you've got anything else you want to add we'd love to see it in the comments um and while you're commenting don't forget to give us uh, a like and subscribe if you do enjoy the video absolutely so, um, so yeah, Rich, do you want to kick us off on the first point, which is headed DLC or downloadable content? So, um, a big worry for us, we're going into a scenario where games are being released, uh, what we would deem to be incomplete, um, and they're being released at say 80, 90% of the content, and then you'll have to buy an add-on to get the full flavor of the game almost so whether that be extra missions or whatever now we have seen really good iterations of this in the likes of say breath of the wild where that was a good addition to the game and the game is as good as it is without that it doesn't create a better game or a more complete game but we've definitely seen uh, more and more games that are moving to this is it fallout 76 One, yeah we can't go to this scenario where Oh, just bang that out and we'll do the rest on downloadable content. I think there's a distinction there, isn't there? There's games like Breath of the Wild that were conceived as whole finite experiences front to back. And then the DLC that came out, it was planned probably beforehand, and they but they seemed to be that they worked on it separate to the, the main game. And it, it wasn't like, you know, they were filling in a part of the story, they just didn't get time to finish in the first go. It was its own thing. And, and that felt, you know, much more honest for that reason. But you, you do get games where, well, Destiny was quite a one for it, that expansion after expansion comes out and, you know, they don't seem to add a great deal of value. They keep you in this kind of gameplay loop, which feels a little bit exploitative. Mm. But I think it, the, the worst crime we've seen of this is where either games aren't really finished when they're released 
and you're only actually getting a, a decent experience maybe six months down the line after mm. two, three, four patches that bring it up to scratch, which is just really poor. You can't sell an iPad, you know, a, a product that's broken or not working very well and mm. then promise fixes down the line. Or e even worse is when a company will actually complete DLC along with the game, but omit the content purposely from the, the initial release, um, just so they can make more money off you down the line. Because essentially that content was ready to go. Sometimes it's mm. even on the disc. It's just locks behind, you know, essentially a paywall. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's the most kind of heinous crime in respect of DLC, at least from my point of view. And it's taking away from that essence of the experience because people that can afford the, down, the, the DLC packs, etc. Uh, you know, people might be buying second-hand games where they've only got like five, ten quid to buy a proper game for, so they wait six months, buy it. They're not getting a DLC, so their gaming experience is so far away from someone that can afford uh, the DLC. Um, it's a shame, you know, it takes away from the experience. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, next up on the list, we've got games as a subscription or an, as an addiction, really. So kind of building on what we've been talking about, you've got um, games that essentially try and, traps a strong word, but exploit players by trapping them in like a cyclical gameplay loop. So usually these are very grindy games, very competitive, that, that promise you this kind of virtual power that you're earning and that you're working towards um, in some kind of online gaming world and platform. So again, we mentioned it already, but Destiny, um, kind of kick-started this, this trend mm. um, and you know really I, I find it very frustrating because I played Destiny I really enjoyed the game loved it um, it didn't have much of a story going for it I think you'd say and it clearly had some um, developmental problems but the gameplay was still really addictive and, and working with players you know forming friendships online very community based in many ways it was it was had a lot going for it but what i did find is throughout the experience just as i'd feel really powerful and i'm coming into my own in this virtual you know world mastering it if you like they'd often reset that grind for you and they did it in all sorts of different ways they give you you know another level to to, to grind up to or they might in certain situations um, reset the kind of the power capabilities of the weapons, which renownedly, renownedly happened with um, Galahorn, which was a rocket launcher, which was so powerful. It was kind of the god weapon of the game. And one expansion came along and essentially kind of just made it redundant. Um, and it just felt very frustrating since you, you mm. learned that. Uh, and, and it just went nowhere. So yeah, we, we've seen it with Destiny, the addiction side of things, games like Fortnite, I'd throw a bit yeah. of mud pie at because, well, we've seen the comments from the likes of uh, Prince Harry. Um, we have, yeah. Mm. Not not being a big fan of it, but I think, again, it just exploits gamers. It, it just wants to keep you trapped in this loop. And, and there's a, a market for that, and there's an audience for that, and I'm not going to try and poo-poo that or take away from people what they enjoy. Some people like kind of Twitch reflex games that are, very much about the, the thrill of the hunt, about that competitive experience. And, you know, live and let live. If you enjoy it, great. But I just hate to see the trend increasing towards these games taking over the entire landscape mm. of, of video games because I just feel, you know, video games should have loftier ambitions and should be designed as these unique experiences that, you know, to revolutionize and innovate um, and it kind of paved the way for, for where the medium can go in the future. Uh, just to kind of cap it, I just feel that there's something really precious about a finite and complete game. And these games that just kind of want to trap you in this gameplay loop and go on forever and keep adding content, it just is a big step away from how, you know, I think we both grew up playing games, mate, you know, these experiences you could share that, that were precious because they ended, 
Greetings, Barcadians. Now, I don't want to labour the point or be too intense about it, but I think this does call for a bit of a philosophical interlude. Consider life. It is meaningful because it is limited and finite. Just as our experiences are, in fact, oftentimes, the more fleeting they are, the more precious they become. If we lived forever, limitlessly, our experiences would blend into one another, forgettably and meaninglessly. Too much of anything is definitely a bad thing. Take a record or CD, for example. They capture a very personal moment in time for the artist, distilled into a physical thing, a symbol and receptacle of precious meaning, something we can keep and cherish beyond the experience. And I suppose that's how I like my games for the most part, supercharged with passion and meaning, but with a definite end in sight something I can also appreciate again after a few years have passed, like you might any piece of art, not diluted into forgettable, drawn-out experiences that become fatiguing and meaningless, a Groundhog Day of sorts, stocked full of the same old tricks, a game extended artificially beyond its natural lifespan. I'm looking at you, games as a service. I won't go into the potential health implications of such games either, the WHO's gaming disorder diagnosis is leading the way for me there. And you may be asking why I've chosen Horizon as a backdrop for this interlude. Well, I'm currently playing it and it's awesome. There may even be a review on the Horizon. Now, where were we? On the flip side to this, because there's always a good side to this, Monster Hunter World. Uh, both really mm. like that game, don't we? Uh, <laughs> they've recently released um, details of the new Iceborne, um, which is like a proper full expansion. New area, new weapons, new rank in there, and even higher rank in there. But that is a full-on, almost separate game to the original game. So the yeah. original game is a well-rounded game. It plays well, it's very grindy, but I like that about it. Um, but it, it, that's what it is. It's not adding loads of stuff in, changing it about. It, that's what it is. They've added this extra on. It's like almost like a second game. That's how you do this kind of thing. That's how you do it. You don't, these little incremental things on it, that mm. it just doesn't work. No, absolutely, mate. And, um, you know, we like those experiences. Fantasy Star Online back in the day. Yeah, As you absolutely. say, Monster Hunter. Mm. We enjoy those games. Yeah, I just, yeah. for me as well, I don't want to see him take over the industry, but also, no. as you point out there, become, you know, deliver these very aggressive forms of those experiences and those sorts of games. Mm -hmm. Get the ball back to you, Rich. We've got the sequelitis and copycat syndrome. So what do we mean there? So, I mean, we're, we're, we're running up to E3 as we speak. Um, undoubtedly, they're going to have the EA. It's a really bad one for this. They're going to release a load of new games, which are basically a variation on the theme that they released last year, the likes of FIFA, NHLs. They add very little to these games. They rehash them and they resell them. They get the, the likes of, say, FIFAs and that. They need to update the players uh, because obviously players are moving around in the football game. But I don't see that they're bringing anything to the game industry other than bringing the, these big corporate companies a lot of money. They're very popular games, but why are they not aspiring to be better than they are? Why are they just rehashing the same thing? And and likewise with this, um, why people are taking, like for instance, Apex Legends, great game, certainly a great game, but what they've done is they've taken Fortnite's idea and then just built on it to create a very similar game. I'm not taking mm. anything away from Fortnite. I'm not taking anything away from Apex Legends, but they're very, they're almost the same game with a different spin on it. It's, it's they like- They feel like cash some, grabs, don't they? Like, exactly. Mm. Have some, have something about you. Have some extra creativity. You know, we want to see unique experiences. I don't want to see fifteen hundred FIFAs over the next hundred years that are all the same. You know, absolutely. You've, you've got to take a risk on new IPs if you want to move. You know, not just your company, your franchise, or whatever forward, but the games industry as a whole have those ambitions. There's a place for sequels. I mean, even look at the likes of Uncharted, Rich, which we absolutely oh, adore yeah. that series, yeah, but yeah. it became a bit of a, it, it wasn't fatiguing in any way because we always look forward to the next game in the series, mm. but they were sequels and they built upon a formula. But I think they did absolutely. enough 
to to you know to really re-establish themselves as a fresh experience in each sequel. Whereas you do see the likes of the games you pointed out, FIFA and Call of Duty, where as you mentioned in the last um, heading, Rich, incremental games. You know they're, they're yeah. very incremental, aren't they? To the point yeah, where yeah. they become stagnant and fatiguing. Um, well, that's that. But that's again, that's a really good point. You know, these games are a really bad way in which people are doing it in the industry. Games like Uncharted, The Last of Us, MGS, they're games where they're sequels or prequels, but they're doing it in such a way that it's creating a better industry. It's creating more creativity. They're, they're, they, these games are different, they're diverse. You know, they're a variation on a theme, but someone spent a long time, three, five, eight years making them. And they're so much different to the previous game, whether it be mechanics, graphics, whatever. Whereas I don't see that in these FIFA games. I just see, oh, it's another FIFA. Oh, it's another Pro Evo, etc., etc. Exactly. And the reason behind that is, is because, as we've said, they have these loftier ambitions that they're looking beyond mm. just the bottom line you know, or keeping their shareholders happy or exploiting gamers for as much money as possible. And they're actually thinking about, you know what, I just want to make a great game because I want to make a great game. I want someone to be exactly. proud of, to have a legacy, to to hit the industry with impact and innovation. And that is the difference. And I, I'm just so scared that we, we see more and more of, you know, what they've often termed as shovelware where they're just shoveling hmm. something out with little passion, little care, little polish, uh, just to, to cash in on either a trend, like you've said, with Battle Royale games, um, or on a popular franchise, which has a loyal fan base to essentially scoop more money uh, out of their wallets on. Absolutely. What we do not want to see is a stagnating game industry where we're seeing stellar AAA titles they've invested huge amounts of money and time and individuals points of views in what we don't want to see is that few and far between every eight to ten years because so the likes of um, red dead redemption 2 brilliant game uh, moved the industry forward i would say in terms mm. of what it did on a technical level but that took eight years what was mm. in between what was in between that was doing that you could say probably the previous GTA, but the titles that are doing that are so few and far between, and that's because lots of these probably brilliant people are stuck working on these franchises. Soulless. That... Yeah. Exactly. Mm. And, and that brings us on very nicely to the next point, which is, um, and probably the source of a lot of the evil we've mentioned so far and we'll go on to mention, the corporate culture invasion, that uh, is what the terminus has, of the gaming industry. So this is the, the you know, the CEOs, the business bots invading the gaming industry, and you can point your finger at a few companies, EA, which I think uh, was very the worst company in America, 2016, 2017. <laughs> um, Activision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was gonna say there's a few others joining that list now, isn't there, really? Even, well, as you mentioned with Fallout 76 earlier on, Rich, Bethesda, who were mm. you know, always a company that I think were fan favourites, that had a loyal fan base. They always respected games and gamers and provided these meaningful experiences we've been talking about. But recently, it almost seems like they've been on the slide into this corporate trap, if you like. Um, you know, they're obviously working on their big AAA revolutionary games, but in between they put out this Fallout 76, which was a bit, felt a bit like a crashy cash grab mm. uh, along the lines of what we've been talking about. So yeah, it, it doesn't just, um, you know, affect games. You look behind the scenes, you get these corporate conglomerates, these big, big corporations, they're buying up talented dev teams. And as Rich said before, you know, that. They're, they're driving them on to, to create these passionless games, suffocating that kind of creativity and inventive game concepts that are first and foremost designed to rinse your wallet and offer very little else apart from that uh, in terms of, as we've said, loftier ambitions. Mm. Um, so yeah, I suppose these, these sorts of business bots that are infecting the industry, they don't seem to be you know, real gamers at heart that have the best of the industry in mind, that go home and, you know, stick breath in the wild and play it for 
three hours into the night. Instead, they just seem to be businessmen that are literally yeah. focused on self-interest, you know, getting ahead for themselves, protecting the business's bottom line, um, and leveraging as much money as they can from consumers. Um, as as like um, as a side to this, uh, recently um, Westwood Studios um, they produced most of the Command and Conquers up until the point where EA bought it. Unfortunately, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I saw a, a video with the head of uh, Westwood. Obviously, he's he might even be retired now. I'm not sure. Um, and the, how passionately he spoke about the games that they were making, about problems that they had to go through. And he wasn't talking about the company making money. That wasn't his bottom line. Mm -hmm. He was like, how can we make the best possible product? Here's the problems we've got to try and solve. How can we solve them? How can we create this brilliant playing game? Um, but I feel like that's sort of missed now. So you have this like pyramid and at the top are the people that are counting the pennies, but underneath, are the people that are passionate. The yeah. trouble is they're, they're being whipped into shape and molded exactly. based on the top of the pyramid. And that mm. is uh, a worrying time for the games industry. We don't want to sit, and, and for everybody involved in games, whether it's people playing games, whatever. And that is the epidemic in the plague that is that, you know, that corporate hierarchy, mm. that corporate mm. structure. But like EA said, didn't they, at one point, they had that sound like, oh, we don't think it's about story games anymore. You know, it's it's not all about that. And then what was it? Was it God of War came out? And did yeah. you like set records for how many games yeah, it yeah. sold? Yeah. So like you said- well, and, and Red Dead Redemption 2, probably the biggest yeah. selling game of all time. Did I read yeah. that recently? And like, it, that couldn't be more of a story game if it tried. You know, and like and like you say that that's that's nonsense. when they have good intentions because they set out mm. to create the best game possible, like you say, mm. and then they they know the byproduct of that will be games will buy it because it's such a quality yeah. product. Whereas EA are more about you know how can we quite quickly, easily, economically, and superficially get money off mm. off people without actually offering exactly. anything with meaning. <laughs> And don't get me wrong, when I say that, I'm not saying that Rockstar are a squeaky clean company. I'm not saying that at all. There's some interesting things which I think we'll come on to shortly Indeed. and that has been iterated by members of staff. I'm not saying that they are a super squeaky clean company, but in terms of their morals and the product, it seems like that is in their, uh, first and foremost, in their mind. Now that might be created because of the fact that they create a game and it sells like there's no tomorrow they drop a trailer for GTA and it breaks the internet. You know, they maybe they don't have to look after their business model quite so much because of that, but I don't know. No, you're right, mate. I, I think it can happen to any company. You look at Bungie, who had such a good reputation for so long, they jump in the bed with Activision and, you know, they're, they're kind of corrupted, you know, over time mm. and, and their vision's gone and the quality of their games and. Uh, they've gone through production hell, uh, developmental hell, um, which has all been reported on. And it, it's like you have these, you know, barrels of lovely, ripe, beautiful apples, and all it takes is a couple of these corporate business bugs to, to kind of <laughs> spread the rot. <laughs> and, and before long, you've got a big old rotten barrel of apples that nobody wants yeah. to, to taste. Forgive me, Barcadians. Another quick interlude as I feel it's necessary to moderate my comments here. Now, I'm not saying there's no place at all for business acumen in the games industry. Far from it. In fact, swing too far in the other direction and we've actually seen hugely created developers come close to the precipice and beyond because they just aren't managing their businesses well enough. There is definitely a balance to be struck here, but my point is that I fear the industry is veering into the wrong direction at the moment. Right, back to it. Um, so yeah, I think more generally, the waves that can have on the industry is, mm. it, it, it can slow progression in the industry yeah. um, mm. because the companies invest as little as possible. That can be in things like you know, game engines, which are continuously resi uh, recycled, dev teams that are kind of um, run on skeletal staff and you know, being forced to do things they really just aren't very passionate about. Hmm. And that creates disenfranchisement, not just in the people developing the games, but then the people who play the products, um, because they're, you know, essentially afflicted with these 
second rate crappy products that just aren't offering any real meaning. It can even pollute uh, console manufacturers themselves um, because we've, we've seen things like trends with generational half steps, um, mm. you know, ramping down on that kind of technical um, progression. Um, I mean, it, it can be done even, even when you, you make those concessions, it can be done well. You, we've seen Nintendo who have taken that kind of whole, we'll, we'll ramp down on the tech, we'll use old tech, but they still double down on the innovation and creativity. So again, Nintendo, the shining exemplars of, you know, just how to do things ethically and, and how to make sure you can move forward as a company with respect to everybody in the industry. Like you say, Rich, and we've touched upon it a couple of times, you head us up on this next topic, which is dev crunch. What do we mean so, by that? I think this is quite linked probably to um, the sequelitis scenario, but this is where the, the people actually developing the games, the code writers, etc., the, the graphics designers, all these people, they're so under the pump to get stuff done by these companies that they're, they're almost having to do half arse jobs, whether they like it or not. Mm. Um, I think I think you've heard of a specific example, haven't you, Sabs at Rockstar, where you know they were almost demanded to work 60 hour weeks and stuff. Yeah, there was some, some kind of sound bites that came out of it to suggest that, and I think this has always been a, you know, a, an issue in the industry. At the end of the day, it's a creative process. And with any creative process, it's very hard to bottle and to measure. So I think exactly. there's always an element that you come to the, you know, the end of a, a deadline or come toward a deadline and there's an element of crunch there because mm. you've been letting it breathe and trying to create it and iterate and iterate, which is all about, the, the, you know, what the games industry is all about, iterating on, you know, each version of the game until you get that final package. So there's always an element of crunch, but yeah, with, with Rockstar, there was all these kind of rumors that that staff were being said, you know, oh, you should be privileged, you should be honoured to work on, to work for Rockstar and on such a kind of monumental, you know, amazing franchise mm. that is GTA. And therefore, you know, you're expected to put in more hours, to work yourself harder, to make sure that, you know, you, you keep up the company standards. Mm. And I think that becomes very exploitative and damaging to people, you know, that they get burned out. You know, they yeah, don't yeah. have, it could even put them off the industry altogether to look exactly. for a whole new line of work. Mm. It's always been a problem, but it's now being, being made worse by, again, perhaps these corporate cultures that are, are coming in and you get headless leadership because, you know, they don't really know how to make games necessarily. They know how to, you know, drive people on and whip them into shape, but they don't really know how to make games with passion and meaning. So ultimately, yeah, they're using these exploitative tactics to, mm. to get the most from people. And there was a really nice quote, mate, that I, I found from, um, I think it was towards datascience.com. The, the, the games industry is um, that the artists have to constantly outperform in quality due to an increasing exigent market. The, the point was that, that they're, they're having to always exceed and push beyond their limitations, which can obviously lead to burnout and just is far too, you know, always being pushed and never being told it's enough is a very, you know, draining sort of work regime, isn't it? So I think that's what it is. Oh, yeah. So to bring us on, Rich, to the next uh, topic, which I'll just introduce, it's what, what I've called us and them or YouTube provocateurs versus games industry elites. So essentially what I'm talking about here is, and you know, again, you could you could look at corporate culture and some of the bad things about the games, games industry recently, which has brought about this divisiveness essentially. Um, and you often see it most um, contrastingly painted when you compare YouTube so you get these, you know, these uh, YouTubers who, it meant in many cases, rightfully spread outrage um, amongst the industry because they're not happy with, you know, games companies and the way they're driving their businesses, the way they're creating games uh, uh, as an exploitation, essentially. Um, but at the same time, you've got these kind of media elitists who are often 
somewhat in the pockets of these big companies and arguably to an extent can see it from their side, you know, that it's not all as, as simply as, as the YouTubers might uh, try and paint it as, that, you know, games developers are bad and they don't know what they're doing and they should do better. So it's often not the case. There's, they're obviously the developers respond to leadership and it's not always what they want to do, they're just having to do it. So what I'm, what I'm supposed I'm getting at here is this divisiveness is just really not good for the industry. It spreads negativity um, and we should practice more moderation in our opinions, in our thoughts. Before we jump to conclusions, we need to look at all the facts. We need to weigh everything up to make sure that, you know, we're not making enemies of each other. It isn't about being divisive and being negative and destructive. It's about being constructive, creating dialogue, feedback. Well, ultimately, you know, what we want is the people making the games to be saying to the people playing the games, what worked well, what didn't work well, not, oh, I don't value your opinion. I'm not interested. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know. You, you need there to be a bridge there, don't you? So exactly. you, you can move forwards together because there has to be a, a commentary on scandals and practices that just aren't acceptable. That has mm. to be done, that's journalism. But if you create these kind of two separate tribes that don't work together anymore, that are completely at odds, and, and you see it with games developers who, um, you know, really strip down their fans on Twitter and things like this, they. It's becoming, it's becoming very divisive and very mm. aggressive in some cases. And again, just to end us on a nice quote which illustrates this, um, this was taken from gamesindustry.biz. Um, we need to find our tribe, but reach out to everybody. So it's essentially saying Absolutely. it's okay to identify with a collective, with a group, or you know, with what you love and enjoy, but at the same time, um, you need to make sure you're open and you are um, collaborative at the end of the day because you know we are just we're all the same and we all want the same ultimately. Definitely. So yeah, build bridges, not fences. To move us uh, back on um, with the next heading, Rich, we've got and you touched on this earlier, microtransactions. Yeah, I, and, and, and in actual fact, I think this is the biggest worry. Um, I personally have for the games industry. So this is like, um, and it, it's rife in the likes of uh, Apex Legends, Fortnite. Um, this is where you can uh, buy tiny little, you know, like costumes or loot boxes or whatever. And, you know, it doesn't, I'll be little bits and stuff, but people are spending like hundreds of pounds on them. I know. Um, someone I work with, their son is really into Fortnite, like can't get enough of it. And he wouldn't think twice of spending his like 50, 60 quid birthday money straight away on Fortnite. Good grief. <laughs> because he wants to have a unique outfit or whatever, and it's literally just cannon fodder. There's nothing, they're, they're, it's just nothing. All it does is give you an outfit. It's not even giving you anything better on the game. Mm. But also there's some games where you can almost buy fame on the game almost if that makes sense so you can you might be able to buy like a better gun or a better pack better weapons whatever that make you better at the game you know and i feel like it's taking away that level playing point between the good players and the you know maybe the not so good players you know there's you know there's match match play nowadays where you could be matched up with someone that's as good a gamer as you um you don't need to have these little microtransactions to to better yourself almost. No, absolutely. I, I think they refer to those as pay to win, don't they? Uh, yes. Bang those on. sorts of microtransactions. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. That is by far the, the worst version of, of microtransactions. Mm. And like you say, they, they ruin that kind of level playing field. That mm. I think always been has always been a big important pillar of video games, like mm you know, all, all people from all walks of life can buy a video game and no matter what their background, rich, poor, you know, you know, what necessarily country they live in or anything, as long as they've got the console, they've got the game, they can play it and they're on a yeah. level playing field and you can share that experience with your friend. And I think this kind of slides into a, a worrying trend 
which kind of introduces social stratification into video games. So, you know, you've got kind of tiers or almost class systems within a gaming or a virtual world that, are, you know, with these types of structures, the more money you put into it, the better your experience, the more premium, the higher level and the better you'll be and perform in that world. And you'll get people who don't want to pay or can't afford to pay, who will end up being um, slighted, if you like, because of that, they won't mm. have the same experience. Um, and it's just, it's not in any way unifying, is it? No, not at all. And again, Rich, you know, the whole channel, why, why we created it, you know, we, we played video games uh, as youngsters and it's our friendship is kind of formed in, uh, on that fact. And, oh, um, absolutely. And, and it, some, of our, some of the best moments we've had together as friends has been while playing video games or something related to video games or, you know, some of those moments where you're both like in awe of a game or you've, you've had such a fun weekend playing a game together, whatever it might be. And, you know, you're taking that away when you can pay to win. Mm, you know, exactly. that's not what you want, is it? It's about uniting again, isn't it? Being constructive. Mm not destructive and divisive, which mm. is some real themes <laughs> spread across <laughs> all of this, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah, um, next up, I'll just touch upon the, could be around the corner of this, streaming platforms. <laughs> so we know that they're becoming very popular. Um, the likes of Google Stadia seem, you know, poised to really drop this on the, on the world. And, um, well, look, we've just seen uh, Sony and Microsoft seemingly make friends um, and, you know, that they're going to be working together to research technologies and to bring together, um, you know, a, a platform, if you like, to for streaming games uh, in the next generation. So, I mean, what did you think on that, by the way, Rich? Because we've not really had a chance to talk about that. No, we've not. Um interesting yeah I, I i i look at it um and think why would they do that because they've been at odds for what past 15 years um mm. actually are they doing that to ensure that if google stadia is a big deal which there we spoke uh so you can go back and watch our google stadia video see our thoughts on that but if it is a big deal, that's why they're doing it. They're almost safeguarding their own companies by merging together to create this potential massive platform that will have all different kinds of games on it. So I think that's almost a safeguarding. That's what I, how I look at it. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, Sony are recognizing that Microsoft have the infrastructure um, if that sort of you know, entertainment gaming platform takes off. Mm. So they're getting in the pockets early, aren't they? They're essentially choosing sides because we know Google have that massive infrastructure already in place and they need to make sure that they, they can respond to that. What were you going to say? I think, I think if you look at, and this is a bit of a segue, but if you look at the likes of Amazon, Amazon's now one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, if people, if their current competitors knew how good it was going to be, would they have preempted it and joined forces with some of their competitors at the time to ensure that when it's all played out, they still have the, as big a market share as they do now. Mm. Whereas now Amazon's just huge. It's almost like an immovable force now. It's almost like that's what they've done to ensure that if Google Stadia takes off, they've bought already in their bank got um, some weapons to fire back at Google Stadia. Absolutely, and that that in itself tells you everything you need to know. They obviously know that streaming platforms are the future. And I think we, me, me and you, Rich, we can say it looks that way, doesn't it? It, it just yeah. seems to be going that Categorically. way. Categorically, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm. So if you're but, a pioneer of something revolutionary like that, and you get in there early, well, as you point out there, Rich, you steal the market share. You call the market. Exactly. Exactly. And profits will follow. So yeah, absolutely. it's really interesting with Sony and Microsoft because we know they have this kind of 
historic bitter rivalry uh, in video games and now they're kind of seemingly putting everything aside. I don't think it's as simple as that because obviously this kind of partnership is just one part of, a, of two very big companies and I Absolutely. think it would take time for that to cascade you know, internally uh, not mm. just externally. So I think we're still going to see PS5, Xbox 2, there's still going to be that whole rivalry. But yeah. slowly, I think we they will merge towards a more collaborative future, which is very mm. interesting. Well, um, and a good friend of ours, uh, and I don't know whether he said this to you, Tabs, um, he sees the Xbox 2, whatever that'll be called, and the PS5 as the blockbuster leaving the stores open. That's what he sees it as which we think is absolute nonsense, but <laughs> if they've already got whatever the alternative is in place, then they're, they're hedging their bets. It doesn't really matter if the consoles only last three, four years before streaming platform is the way, they've already got that in the bag. So I think undoubtedly that's what it's for, but it is worrying because we love, um, we love video games. We, I think ultimately we're gonna move to it, but it's a worry because it's not something we really want. But. And I don't want to be the big doomsday, you know, naysayer or whatever, but you know, I've said it before and I'll, I'll say it again. The worrying signs are that we, we're heading towards a future where we are going to be monopolized by these, you know, mm -hmm. a select few of corporate conglomerates who mm -hmm. just become the absolute arbiters of all of our entertainment. So I'm talking, you know, film, TV, music, video games. And if there is, say, two or three of these big corps in the world who have, you know, that market share, they, they corner that market, well then they've they've got us by the short and curlies, you know, they can restrict output, they can crank up all the prices, you know, just to enjoy their those profits. It's almost like they'll say, no, no, this is the music you'll like. Uh, no, no, this is the TV you'll like. Exactly, yeah, that, that, that's another thing. The, the algorithms that, you know, choose the entertainment for us. And mm. they've not got that right, I, I find, on Netflix, you know. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I want to see things that has got, I, I, I value reviews first and foremost. If something's got a fairly good review, well, I know it's not going to waste my time. And I know we differ a bit on that front, Rich, mm. but the, the algorithms they use on platforms like Netflix, sometimes they're, they're foisting stuff at you, they're thrusting stuff at you, which is just, you know, not what I'm necessarily interested in, or yeah, exactly. good quality. I do, um, um, just, just, cool. just to, um, I think you can turn that off in uh, Netflix times. Can you? I believe so, I think it's in settings, it says you can turn off suggested content, I think. Oh, that's cool then. I didn't know that. I'm pretty certain I've seen that anyway. But yeah, I, I suppose I what I'm, I'm scared of us heading into a world where we're kind of hooked up uh, to these revenue streams um, that are taking monthly subscriptions. You know, almost you could compare it to The Matrix or Ready Player One. We're like these kind of batteries for these big corporations who are just draining us dry and prescribing all of our you know, entertainment and our content. And, and you could even say molding us with that. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, you could take it very far and it's obviously not that far as things stand, but it's just there's some worrying signs there for the future. Definitely. So we're nearly there now. <laughs> it's been an exhausting video, I think, all around. But yeah. um, the, the last heading, Rich, if you can, uh, kick us off, finish us off with, is what we're calling discoverability in the marketplace. So what do we mean? So so in essence, uh, almost exactly what we've just been discussing, you know, mm. um, with us moving into this thing where potentially all the platforms are owned by big games developers themselves, are they giving that voice and that visibility to these small indie games that we love some indie games they're brilliant you know some of them are, are seriously unique in the gameplay mechanics you know and, and and not just that but some of these games are being developed by like one person in his shed or one person in his studio <laughs> and and that's giving him a voice to give his creative um passion to the world and by by moving into this scenario where almost what we what we're able to 
to see and, and, and read about, etc., is controlled by these massive corporate companies. Are we going to lose all these little indie games and all these independent developers? And it's a worry moving forwards. No, absolutely right, mate. And I think, again, that is one of the biggest concerns, not just from the kind of consumer point of view of being prescribed content, being pushed into the experiences they want you to have. But also, as you say, you know, that the actual creative force and drive behind the gaming industry, which is the developers making the games. Mm. And if they have no means to break through into the industry, like they can these days, as you say, a man in his shed, <laughs> making, uh, <laughs> making his, you know, his passion project come to life. And oftentimes it can be the start of a uh, career in video games. Mm. But if, if these corporate conglomerates have got hold of it, hold of the, the games industry, the market, well, then they become the barriers to entry. They, mm. they become the only way you can get into the industry. And it, it might then mean these zero to hero stories are, are no more. And you have to kind of become a slave to some big games developer, a big company that are creating projects that just don't, you know, don't make you happy and, uh, mm. and don't increase your passion. So yeah, I, I, what the answers are to all these problems, yeah, I'm not no entirely idea. sure. Regulation is definitely going to be a big thing. You see it across banks and other industries. We need it more so in video games. Some sort of independent body that can regulate and, and make sure that competition is still there, that you know best practices are still um, you know being followed and it doesn't become too exploitative, too capital, capitalist. Um, yeah, and just dystopian. Um, hmm. So what about you, Rich? Any final thoughts on solving any of the issues we've mentioned? Or? Well, I think that's, that's our biggest worry right now, isn't it? That it's seemingly no one's got the answers to these things at the moment. Um, some of them are getting worse and worse as the, as the month and years go by. So. Uh, I think we are in a worrying time and, and hopefully as a collective group of people playing games and I, I sort of uh, put my hand up to the, to the developers in this one that we can group together, uh, be constructive and mm. give feedback where it's required in, in the right way um, and that doesn't mean a rant on Twitter or Instagram or whatever um, that gets the developers back so, but in a constructive way we can say, we're worried about this, what are you doing about it? Or is this a concern? You know, when when royals of this country are saying, I'm worried about this, about gaming, then I think there's a legitimate dialogue to be had there. And at the moment, I don't see that there is one. I think that's bang on, mate. It's, it's having the courage, isn't it, to stand up and be positive and offer, you know, a courageous, um, positive voice which is constructive and not to be lulled into the you know the smog of negativity which is mm. can often can often be the case and mm. it's you've got to call things out it's always good to call things out but just absolutely tem temper it and i think that's what we can do as individual gamers um more so than ever you choose a great platform for you know for spreading uh, your, your mm. thoughts and opinions and we all we all shape things don't we over time it's a, it's a cultural fabric there I mean, ultimately, we started this um, YouTube channel for our collective love of games, and we wanted to share that with a community that we created online, that mm. we could all share that passion, all group together, all of one or have similar interests and ideas about games, but also create a dialogue in that community that what's good about the games industry, what's bad about the games industry, what mm. can we do? You know, that's why we do this. So create a tribe we, and, and enjoy identifying with, with that tribe, mm, if you like. Exactly. But at the same time, making sure you're moving forward in a good direction, not aimlessly mm. or definitely not backwards, you know. Exactly. Um, and also valuing the opinions of other YouTube tribes, as we're calling them, you know, valuing the opinions of everyone, you know. Just because someone's opinion differs to you, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means they look at it in a different way to you. Mm. And we need to make sure, you know, the world works for everybody, not just one of exactly. us. Exactly. Not just mm. a few of us, but everybody. But, so, I mean, we, gaming is such a, um, 
I guess a cathartic thing for us. It's a it's a relief. It's a way of escapism. Almost you can do anything in it. What we don't want to do is lose that, and it become this corporate nonsense that just is so bland and negative that you don't want to do it anymore. Because ultimately, this is one of our passions in life. Yeah, absolutely, mate. It, it has to be meaningful, and for it to be a meaningful experience. So yeah. I, I think that's um, <laughs> we've exhausted not, not, that one. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we've not bored everybody to death. Um, we will create an in short <laughs> episode <laughs> for this, which um, <laughs> might be the most popular version of it. But yeah, so um, if uh, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give us a like, uh, and if you didn't, a dislike. Feedback's always welcome. Uh, if you want to see more from us, then please don't forget to click the subscribe button and ring that bell for notifications. And I think that's about it. Another one for the archives. Stamped and completed.